Hey guys, welcome back. So today we're out at the range with a rifle I've gotten hundreds of requests for. The rifle would be the Mini 14. Now, I've not done a video with the Mini 14 because honestly, I don't have all that much to say about it that's very flattering. I love it, it's a piece of American history. It has a very interesting history, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. And it's something of an icon, at least from my era. When I was a kid growing up, this is probably one of the most commonly encountered rifles out there. The survivalist movement loved them. Uh, just kids growing up loved them. Why? Well, it's basically a miniaturized version of the M14. So this one chambers 223, not 556, and it's a 181 series gun. So that means it's kind of a second generation gun, which has some changes done to the bolt hold open and a few other things. But this is a very early rifle. You can tell that from its wooden top handguard heat shield here and the exposed operating rod, which would later be covered up. And it's just a classic rifle. Now, why don't I like it that much? Well, I love the M1 Garand. The M14, I think, was a poor military service rifle, and this is a miniaturized version of the M14. So, anyway, with that being said, a lot of you guys wanted to get my thoughts on the Mini 14. We're going to talk about this one, which is one of the original guns. And then I've brought out a more modern rifle that's chambered in 300 blackout. It's called a Mini 30. We'll talk a little bit about the history of the gun here in a minute. So let's go ahead and charge the rifle up. I only have 10 rounds loaded. I only have a little bit of 223 ammunition. Most of the stuff I have is 5.56. So you saw me charge the rifle there. And uh, let's get this party started by firing off a few rounds and take a closer look at the Mini 14 of old and of new. Yeah, it's got its quirks, but it's pretty darn American. All right, let's get started. So having a Mini 14 slung on my shoulder right now really reminds me of my childhood. A good friend of mine, Mike, had his, and I had my AR-15, and I remember Mike trying and trying and trying to get the best groups he could with his Mini 14, and I would spank him with my AR-15, but he was committed to making that Mini 14 work for him. So. Yeah, this little rifle really brings back some fond memories of my youth. And it really kind of is an icon of my era, Generation X, for all you trolls out there that call me a boomer. I'm not a boomer, my mom was. But um, yeah, this gun really does kind of define my generation a little bit. Everybody had one. But um, yeah, so there's many, many memories of me walking around in the woods of Kansas. Of course, now I live in Indiana. And we would just find targets of opportunity and just hang out, go camping with the rifles and stuff like that. And it just, man, it just seems like it was yesterday. And my buddy Mike, man, I miss you, brother. I know you watch the videos every once in a while and we're gonna have to get together in here soon before we all die of old age. But yeah, what fun guns and very, very fond memories. Now, other something else that's kind of interesting to note is I really learned how to bump fire with the Mini 14. And that's because the gun lends itself to it. Back in the 80s, the ATF hadn't yet decided that the boot string on your boot could be used as a machine gun. And there's a lot of people back then selling videotapes at gun shows that would show a boot string being tied around the charging handle in the forward position, coming back, wrapping it once around the trigger, then tying it off in the rear sling swivel, pull the bolt to the rear, let it go, and it would pull its own trigger. Later, the ATF would classify that as a machine gun. But I didn't need any stinking boot strings because I bump fire and I learned I cut my teeth on bump firing on one of these rifles and uh, yeah <laughs> so many fond memories of these old guns I really love the way the, the wood looks on the 181 series guns beautiful beautiful guns not the most accurate definitely high in the fun category especially for a 16 year old kid walking around the woods of Kansas Let's take the Mini 14 apart really quick here and show you what it looks like on the inside so you can see the similarities between it and the M1 Garand or the M14, which it's more like the M14. All right, so it has a detachable magazine. You have a little release right here by my index finger. Push that, magazine pops forward and comes out. It has a locking hole right here in the front. So it's a rock and lock, kind of like an AK. You put this in first, a little nub will go in the hole and then you rock it back and you have a shelf here on the rear of the magazine that engages with the flapper release. 
On the later models like this one, which is a 181 series, I can pull the bolt to the rear, push down on this little button, and that'll lock the bolt. So we can then inspect the chamber to make sure that the weapon's clear, which it is. Gonna go ahead and let the bolt go home. Invert the rifle, has a hole cut in the trigger guard, just like a Garand or an M14. So you can put a bullet in there to pry this back, but generally speaking, you shouldn't have to do that. You can just pull back on them and up, and the triggers will pop right out. Now, if you take a look at this, that is very Garand slash M14-like. Once you got your trigger group out, you can just kind of grab the gun, which is a little bit warm from shooting. You can see how it just kind of rocks forward, just kind of wiggle it here, and the stock will come off. And then you have your action here with the older ones. It's just a simple wood top hand guard with a spring clip pop it off, and there you can see how the action of the gun works. So we have a fixed piston right here in the front, and then we have a charging handle operod that operates the bolt. All right, let's go ahead and take it apart. Just like the M1 before it, take your recoil spring out, pull the bolt to the rear, there's a little notch cut right here. So I'm gonna pull the charging handle to the rear, kind of lift up, pops off, and then the bolt, you kind of rotate it and wiggle it, <clears throat> and it comes out. So there you go. Mini 14 field stripped, very, very simple. Now with the later M14 rifles, you'll notice, or Mini 14 rifles, you notice that the top hand guard's now polymer. It has an overhang protecting the op rod. So when you grab it, you won't get your hand in the way and possibly induce a malfunction. You'll also notice this one has the integral scope mount. And then it has a really, uh, what I'm gonna say it has poor sights. The newer sights pale in comparison to the older sights, which I'll, I prefer in terms of their durability and ease of use. All right, so one thing that you'll notice about this rifle is that it has a very thin profile barrel. Later, Ruger would beef the barrel up. They would improve the accuracy with these guns. The accuracy is abysmal. Uh, you'll, you would find aftermarket companies putting struts in here to strengthen the rigidity of the barrel, to try to improve the accuracy. But as a general rule, these guns were not sub-minute guns. They weren't minute guns unless you count, you know, six to eight minutes <laughs> as being accurate. So it's minute a man out to 100 yards. Uh, but that didn't seem to decrease the popularity of the guns whatsoever. Um, you know, if you go back and take a look at the 80s, a lot of people carried these around. Uh, you would find, you know, like survivalists loved them. If you take a look at, um, you know, I was just watching a documentary on, on the whole Waco standoff, not Waco, I'm sorry, the Ruby Ridge standoff, and Randy Weaver had a Mini 14. All right, got the, the bolt in there now. Take the op rod. Set it down in its little notch there. All right, slide that forward. Once you get it on the bolt, yep, there we go. Slide that forward to get it up over its gas piston. Take your recoil spring, put her in there. And it just has a little dimple on the front. Okay, you don't have a cross pin like you do on the other rifle, on the M14 or M1 Grand. All right. And then you just set the stock back in. See if I can get my sling untwisted here. There we go. Put the nose of the stock in there and its retainer. And then kind of pull it back. Come on, sweetie. There we go. All right, take your trigger. Set that in there. And pop it into place. Take your upper hand guard. There you go. All back together. All right, let's see what this gun does in terms of accuracy. I have some American Eagle. As good as it's gonna get, not match ammo, 223, 55 grain. This is sent to us by our friends over at Federal. And you're gonna find this a very clean ammunition and you're gonna get decent accuracy out of it, out of most guns. <laughs> 
So that's what we're shooting this afternoon. Thanks Federal for supporting us. I went to them because I've shot the ammunition since I was a kid and absolutely love Federal ammo. All right, so I have managed to not load a magazine. So let's go ahead and load a magazine here really quick. We'll just load up 10 rounds. We'll, two, we'll shoot two five shot groups and I'll have to spread them out because they will overlap given the accuracy of this gun or lack thereof. There's five. Now the original Mini 14, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. The original Mini 14 has a simple blade here in the front. Then we have a aperture sight here in the rear, which can easily be adjusted, unlike the newer models, which require tools, with the tip of a bullet. Okay, you got your windage adjustment here and your elevation adjustment there. Very simple adjustments to make in these original rifles. The guns are exceptionally lightweight and feel really, really good. I mean, you want to love the gun. I, I, I mean, I do for what it is. But compared to an AR-15 for accuracy, uh, it, it's just, it's antiquated. It's much like the M14. It was just dated before it even went into production. There were more modern designs. Now this is cool because America loves the M1 Garand, rightfully so, and that love kind of bled over into the really bad M14. The M14 was a really bad service rifle. It's a great shooting, fun, hunting, general rifle, but as a military service rifle, that poor gun was dated the day it went into surface. We should have adopted the FAL like the rest of our allies. We didn't. We stuck with nostalgia, which was a horrible mistake, which is why the M14 was one or is one of the shortest uh, served U.S. military infantry rifles as a primary issue. I know some of you guys are going to say, but it's still in service today. Yeah, it's forced into service because we couldn't make scars fast enough and we needed a 308 in the wide open spaces of the Middle East. Doesn't make it a good gun. All right. So safety's right there. Pop it off with your firing finger, just like its predecessors. And I'm going to take my glasses off here so I, I give it as, as uh, good a chance as I possibly can. And we'll shoot two five-shot groups here really, really quick. I have to shoot the right side because I won't hit my target holder. There's our first five shot group. All right, looks like we're gonna have a four shot group because I don't think the bolt went all the way home. It didn't pick a round up. So I'm pushing down on the magazine and it looks like we may have just caused a malfunction in the old mini. All right, locks open, last shot fired. The Mini 14 started life in 1973. Now here's an interesting piece of history about the Mini 14. There's a gentleman by the name of Jim Sullivan. Ever heard of him? Yeah, he worked with Eugene Stoner to make the AR-10 into the M16. Sullivan had this knack, this penchant for being able to take big guns and turn them into small guns. And that's basically what Ruger and Sullivan did in developing this gun. They took an M14, downsized it, made some significant changes, but for the most part, kept the look and feel of the M14, but it fired 223. The original gun, had no facilities for a bolt hold open, except it would lock open a last shot fired, but it didn't have a button to lock that bolt open. So that was added later. In 1982, this gun, which is a 181 series gun, there was a 180 series that came before it, which lacked that bolt hold open, manual hold open, but still looked very much similar to this one. But in 1982, Ruger introduced the ranch rifle. The ranch rifle changed things around a little bit. They put those uh, integral scope mounts up there on the receiver, and made some other changes to the handguard and stuff like that. And they tried to improve the accuracy of the gun a little bit, but really wasn't all that successful. And then in 1987, the Mini 30 entered the scene, which was a 
ranch rifle, if you will, that was chambered at 762 by 39 and later 300 blackout. So the gun's been through some evolutionary changes, but throughout all those, ch all those changes, it's pretty much stayed the same in terms of basic operation. Still uses investment cast receiver, still uses a modified version of the M14's gas system and all that good stuff. Now today you can find them with all sorts of different amenities on them. Uh, no longer do you have to put up with just standard wood, although I like the standard wood and I really like this upper hand garden wood. But you can get the polymer stocks, you can get different wood stocks, you can get all sorts of crazy stuff. You can get tactical versions with muzzle devices and all that cool stuff. So the guns evolved over the years, but it's still on the market and it's the gun still has something of a following, although it's truly been eclipsed by more modern designs, and you're not going to see people clamoring for these rifles much anymore. And I don't know if Ruger's going to make them forever. It only makes sense that they may actually drop the gun from the lineup at some point, because really, it just doesn't appeal to modern shooters as much as more modern designs do, it seems. So the groups that I shot with the, uh, the Mini-14, the 223 version. So as you can see from the images, the gun at 50 yards is shooting 4 MOA, sometimes high 4 MOA, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's just kind of what the guns were all about. They were not accurate at all. And again, people spent a lot of time trying to accurize these things before Ruger started making some changes with heavier barrels and things like that, which brings us to our Mini 30. Now, I don't have any newer Mini 14s, because I honestly don't really want a 223 caliber miniaturized version of an M14. The Mini 30 always appealed to me. This gun came around 1987 initially as a 762 by 39 and later offered in this 300 blackout. Now, it is an investment cast receiver, and obviously you can see the barrel's much thicker on this thing now, and I do have an OSS can on it. Now, these are suppressible. This gun does cycle subsonics just fine, but I don't know. Our gunsmith said, if you're going to run a traditional baffled suppressor on one of these, you might want to do it sparingly and with subsonics only and don't shoot supers because you can actually break something on the guns, according to him. A never broken one, don't know, pure conjecture, but he did caution us against doing it, which is why I run OSS on gas guns, especially ones that might actually damage themselves because it reduces the back pressure and the guns don't overgas themselves. So, as I've already pointed out, this rifle has this different polymer upper heat shield now. It actually has some metal inside there. Here we have integral scope rings and we have this updated rear sight. Now you have uh, screws on both sides. You loosen one, tighten the other, and it moves that rear sight back and forth. I had to move this rear aperture all the way over to the right just to get it on paper. So you may want to run the rings or the mount. You can put a Picatinny rail on it and put a red dot sight on it. It'd probably be a little bit better for you. It just seems like I don't know, Ruger lost some mojo a little bit with, with the rear sights. I really like the earlier sights much better. Um, you can actually move this. There's just one screw holding it on, slides loosely onto a dovetail. You tighten this one screw down. That's what holds it in place. You can loosen the screws and rot a a twist the rear aperture up and down to adjust for elevation. And then you tighten and loosen rear screws. Think of an FAL, for example, to get the windage adjusted. And so it's a little bit confusing for people that aren't used to that type of adjustment. Your front sight, you have protected ears now versus just the exposed blade, and that's roll pinned in place. All right, now this one has the fiberglass stocks. You can still get them with wood stocks. And um, yeah, you can get them now with half by 28 threads. This is 5 eighths by 24 because it's a 30 caliber. I have an older OSS on here. And you will find that they have 300 blackout specific magazines. So if you take a look at one of the, come on, get out of there. Take a look at one of the original Ruger 20 rounders for the 223 and here's the 300 blackout. Um, they mark the 300 blackout mag. All right, so let's do a little bit of shooting with the Mini 30 and see if there's really any improvement in the accuracy between this rifle and its older predecessor with the lighter weight barrel. We will be shooting some of the uh, American Eagle. Again, this is donated to us by our friends over at Federal. This is 220 grain subsonics. And uh, again, the stuff runs really, really clean and I've had really good accuracy out of it in other rifles. Let's see how good the Mini 14 shoots and see if they've really drastically improved the accuracy or not. I believe I have 10 rounds loaded. I'm gonna go ahead and put my ears on even though we're shooting subs and we are suppressed. And we'll shoot at the left side of the target here.
It's a little bit hard to get a good sight picture because the can is the exact same height as my front sight post. Okay, there's our first group. All right. So as you can see, the gun cycles just fine with the subsonics. And that's what the low back pressure can, so it's not requiring the back pressure of a traditional baffled can to get enough gas pressure to cycle the gun. So it does work just fine with the subs. All right, not had very good luck with the 7.62x39 guns. Won't own another one, uh, but the 300 blackout gun seems to work just fine. Let's take a look at those groups and see what the old Mini 30 put down versus the original Mini 14. The Mini 30 makes more sense to me, you know, the M14 being 30 caliber 308, having it with a 30 caliber pill just in a reduced power cartridge seems to make more sense to me and that's why I kind of like the Mini 30. It's a neat rifle. The accuracy that we get out of it is, well, the best group we shot was about 2.7 MOA at 50 yards, then we had one that was like 3.7 MOA. So really the accuracy, it just isn't there. I mean, this is not a sub MOA gun. This thing cannot compete with an AR-15. Now granted, my front sight post is exactly the same height as this, but I still get a good enough sight picture to actually see what I'm doing. So um, it's just, no matter how much Ruger beefs up the barrels and whatnot, the gun just isn't very accurate. But at 2.7 MOA, if it can hold that, that's more than enough for me. Like I've always said, two and a half to three MOA is all you really need out of a defensive rifle. And for me, no ears, subsonics, OSS suppressor, it's just a lot of fun to shoot. Nice and quiet. Notice there's just absolutely no recoil. Very, very pleasant to shoot in 300 blackout. So much for not being able to bump fire from the shoulder, right? Very, very muted recoil impulse. I'd say it's even less than the 223 shooting these subsonics. It's a very, very cool little gun. Now the polymer stocks are gonna be nice for if you wanna go camping, things like that. You're gonna be out in the weather. Uh, they even make them in stainless steel. So you can get them with bird cages and whatnot. This one originally had a bird cage on it. Took it off, of course, for the suppressor. But yeah, it's a neat little gun. The only thing I would highly recommend if you're gonna get one of these, put an optic on it. You're gonna find that the, the sights are just marginally okay. They'll get you by, but it's set up for them. Put a red dot sight like an MRO or something like that on it, aim point, or even a primary arms. I think you're gonna get more out of the gun that way. But yeah, I mean, they're not inexpensive and there are better guns out there in terms of accuracy and perhaps even ergonomics. But if you like the M14 and the M1 Grand, this may actually, you know, flip your switch a little bit. I mean, it does have that appeal. I know what you guys are probably going to ask, and that's, well, will the 300 blackout round work out of the standard magazine? This is not the 300 blackout magazine. There's no markings on it. This is the original Mini 14 mag. Got 20 rounds loaded. Let's see if it works. Seems to work just fine. This is the 300 blackout mag. It's marked on the side. Works just fine. <laughs> so yeah, it'll work with standard 5.56 magazines. You don't need the dedicated 300 blackout mags in case you have one of these. 
Guys, if you'd like to support us here at the Military Arms Channel, you can do that by swinging by, checking out Copper Custom, or you can shop at our online store. Also, don't forget we are Twitch gamers. There is a link down below, follow that link, go by, subscribe to us over there on Twitch. And if you're a Patreon supporter, you can actually send me an email, let me know that you're a patron, I'll double check that, and I'll add you as a friend, and you can actually join us in some of our live streams. Guys, thanks for 11 years of support. We hope you enjoyed the Mini 14 video. Now I can go put them away again for a long, long time. We'll talk to you soon.